shows and uh, just uh, wanted to tell you uh, folks here, especially from North Dakota, the longer we're here, the more home we feel. And uh, thank you for your hospitality, generosity, and just your friendships, getting to know you. It's, it really has been a blessing. And the other reason that the longer we're here, the more uh, it feels like home is because uh, in northern Indiana, they say if you don't like the weather, stick around a couple days, it'll change for you. And I see it's not much different up here. It, uh, whew, it changed overnight and uh, a little bit different this morning than what it was yesterday. That's all right. We praise the Lord for it. Uh, the other evening or the other morning, I guess it was, had a message on a family and uh, last evening visiting with uh, Jamie and Julie a little bit afterwards and something came up and I thought you know I should just mention that I, I don't think I specifically mentioned it and that is uh, and this is something I, I'm not I feel we were blessed to have in our home and uh, not that they were never strained but blessed to have and still have with our children and that is build relationships with your children uh, the other things we talked about so important that you have a relationship with your children and that starts uh, when they're young don't wait till they're teenagers to try to build a relationship. And if you don't have a relationship with them and they're teenagers, then start now at least. But And relationships, whether it's with your children or anyone else, a uh, couple things that it takes. One is time and one is communication. And communication means not only talking but listening. It's a two-way thing, communication. So build relationships with them and you will be blessed as you go through uh, other times and maybe struggles and trials you have those relationships. This morning, I want to talk about the glory of the Lord. And I want to, I'm going to open it up a little bit here this morning. I don't know if you're comfortable doing this, but can somebody just tell me what you think about when you think about the glory of the Lord? Does anyone, if you don't have anything, that's okay. But if somebody has something that just comes to your mind when you think about the glory of the Lord, what do you think about? What's that? The stars, yeah, the name for everyone. Someone back here said something. Yeah, yeah, faith. Uh -huh. It is beyond comprehension, but we think about these things. Yes. Anyone else? Illuminate. Yes. Yes, strength. Yes. Penetrating. It's power. Yeah. They're all things that we think about when we think about God's glory. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 16. And while you're turning there, a couple of verses I'd like to share. One of them is in Isaiah 42, verse 8. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. And I want you to think about that verse as we go through the message. He's not going to give his glory to anyone else. And yet, we're going to see something really, I, to me, it's become exciting. Something in the New Testament involving God's glory and, and, and us and our, maybe our responsibility and our worship to that and how we share that. I will say this, though, and this is a complete aside, maybe, from the message. I don't want it to be distracting from it, but I think it's, it's something to think about. When he says, my glory will I not give to another, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians 11. It's in the context of where we believe a woman is to be veiled. It says, for man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. A man does not cover his head because it says he is the image and glory of God. Now, as we think about as we go through the message, you see sometimes where it talks about being veiled and unveiled, and we think about the glory of God. A man is not to be veiled because he is the glory of God. You don't cover God's glory. But it says the woman is the glory of the man, and we are to cover our glory. So when a woman does not cover, she is letting a man's glory compete with God's glory. Now you think about that. Now think about that in, 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 in a context of what we believe as far as the veiling and so forth. And study that out. That's pretty important, I think. And uh, pretty, pretty heavy stuff there as we think about that. 
Well, as we go to Exodus chapter 16 here, just to kind of pick up some verses where we see God's glory mentioned here in the Old Testament, and there are many. In Exodus chapter 16, starting at verse uh, 7, it says, And in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings, or your complaints. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. I wonder what that cloud looked like. The glory of the Lord appeared in it. Even in their murmurings and their complainings, the glory of the Lord showed up and, and was there. And, and God was revealed in that way, in the glory. And he, and he did hear their murmurings and their complainings and so forth. And you go over to chapter 19, and you'll see his glory mentioned again. In chapter 19, verse 20. Must be damp here this morning. My pages are sticking together. Except when the wind blows them. Okay, chap, uh, verse 20. And the Lord came down upon the Mount Sinai and the top of the mount, on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the reason I read that is because as we go on to chapter 24, and we see some things. We're going to look at uh, some, some verses here. In, uh, regarding Mount Sinai, in verses uh, 14 to 18 there we'll read, in chapter 24, And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you, and if any man have any manners to do, let him come to them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon the Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and get him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. I don't know how excited you would have been about going into that cloud with that kind of stuff going on. The children of Israel were told you stay back. They said you put it, you keep everybody away from the mountain. Keep them back. The glory of the Lord is going to be here. Don't let anybody come there. Don't even let your animals come there. And if they do, you know, shoot them. Get, they, they can't. You, don't, you can't do that. The glory of the Lord was so powerful and so awesome and so mighty that they were to, to stay clear. And here Moses went up there, and God called him, and he went into the cloud, and there he met God. And we'll see how that reflected upon him later. One of, the, one of the things I want us to note in the Old Testament here is, and we're going to compare that to the New Testament, is how the glory of the Lord was, uh, it brought really fear and trembling. Now, I want to say this. If Jesus Christ showed up right here, right now, in his glorified state, we would all be on our faces too. I sometimes get troubled with this idea that, well, I can't wait to get to heaven. I'm going to dance around the throne and all this. I don't think so. I think you're going to be flat on your face in awe and worship of an almighty, awesome, glorious Savior. Yes, he is our friend. And yes, I believe there's a time when we will, he will hold us, we, whatever, but I, our appearance. I, I think of John, his, almost his best friend while he was here on earth. And when John saw him, it says in Revelation, he fell on his face as dead, and he was in awe. But here in the Old Testament, often the glory of the Lord brought uh, somewhat of a fear and trembling to them. In, um, so we're going to look here in, in uh, chapter, uh, let's go over to chapter 29. And 29, verse uh, 43. He 
He says, And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory, or made holy, or set apart by my glory. That's what was going to sanctify it. And then if we go over into chapter 34, uh, we'll look at verses uh, 29 through 33. Boy, the pages of my Bible are giving me a little trouble this morning. There we go. Starting verse 29, And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of, of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. And this, is, this passage is important for what we're going to look at in the New Testament. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had, spoke, had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he had commanded, which was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, and the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. Can you imagine that the glory of the Lord was so powerful, and Moses had spent time with him, that his, his face just glowed to a point where the people were afraid. and They, did, they didn't know what to do. And, and so he hung a veil across his face so that he could actually visit with people. That much glory radiating from Moses. And we go on now to uh, 40, chapter 40. And it's interesting, somebody thought about Moses with this, the whole thing of the glory of the Lord. So Moses, chapter 40, verse 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon. Moses couldn't even go in, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, they journeyed not till the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire on it by night and the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeyings. Now, the word uh, for glory in the Old Testament is an interesting word. And often the word that is, that is used for uh, this, it's translated sometimes as splendor, honor, abundance, riches. It's tied closely with worship. And the word is um, kavod. Kavod is the, is the word that is used, and in the uh, the word the root word for that is um, kavod, which is very similar. Kavod, I think it is, and the root of uh, that is to, the what the word really means is to be heavy or weight. And you think, well, how? What? What, what is the glory? What does that have to do with weight or heaviness? And it doesn't mean that God looks like Buddha or something. I don't know. I never figured that guy out anyway. But, you know, it's not. But what does it mean? Heavy. What, what does that have to do with glory? And we're going to see a verse when we get to the New Testament. That's interesting how Paul uses this idea of the, the Hebrew root word there and uh, compares it to our uh, afflictions here. Maybe that actually gave you a clue what verse that is. But the, the idea is, have you ever heard someone say after maybe someone talked or they shared or they said something and somebody goes, wow, that, that's some heavy stuff. That's heavy. We don't think about it. It's hard to pick it up. It, it's heavy stuff. Or maybe someone else is lighthearted. You see the difference there? Something's lighthearted versus something that's heavy. And that's really what it comes down to, that the glory of the Lord is something that is weighty and heavy and mighty and it's not something to be taken lightly and it's interesting that even on in our English there's somewhat of a connection to those words in that way 
And so as we think about that, that God's glory is something that, that, is, that is heavy and weighty and mighty and awesome in that way. And it is translated into in, in other ways. And we're going to see that verse when we get to 2 Corinthians. Now, I want to look at a couple of other things here in the Old Testament uh, re- regarding the glory of God. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7, and this is after uh, the temple is built, and the temple is dedicated, all the prayers, so forth, and there's a lot more sacrificing goes on. And, but now it says here in verse uh, 1 of Second Chronicles 7, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Now, the sad thing is, is if you go into Ezekiel chapter 10, he sees the glory of the Lord leave the temple. It departs. Ichabod, it's gone. No more glory there. Now, if you go in about chapter 43, the glory returns, and it depends on your view of eschatology, how and when and where that all happens. But anyway, there is a returning of the glory. But... The temple was filled with the glory. And, and just to see that, the awesomeness of when God's presence was there, what that did. Now, I want to, I want to, as we go into the New Testament, I want to talk about something before we go there. And that is this fact, that God's glory is intrinsic. He is, it's intrinsic with God. You cannot, uh, I think it was maybe someone this morning mentioned, uh, God's power, you can't really add to it. Uh, you can't take away from it. God's glory is God's glory. And, and it's just intrinsic to him. It's just who he is. It's, uh, you know, it's a little bit like Kevin back here. He is intrinsically a human being. Um, I'm pretty sure of that. And, uh, and there's nothing I can do about that one way or another. I, I can say he's not. It doesn't change the fact that he is a human being. I can even... And I would never want to do this, um, and it'd be horrible. I could even kill him, and it wouldn't change the fact. Now, he would be a physically dead human being, but his spirit and soul would still be alive. He'd still be a human being, and we will forever be. It doesn't change that. He, it, intrinsically, and it also, his humanity does not change whether or not he's a human, because I give him uh, praise for something or I don't. I can, I can praise him for his singing and for his family singing. So it, it's, it's, it may bring him some glory or whatever, and I'm not saying we should take that as ourselves, but what I'm saying is, but it's not going to change the fact that he's a human or make him more or less of one. I'm simply acknowledging some things about him when I do that. It's the same way with God. God has his glory whether or not I acknowledge it or not. But I need to. And God's glory and our worship are so closely tied together as far as our response to it. His glory doesn't change if we worship or not. He's still who He is. We change when we worship Him. And He wants our worship. He desires our worship. He desires our praise because He is a glorious, glorious God. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is really uh, where, I, where I want us to really think about some things this morning. And, and this was a blessing to me to look into this passage. And I think I'm going to start reading at verse 1 of chapter 3 so that you get the context here. Uh, Paul begins this passage really talking about the fact that 
he doesn't need to be commended and they don't need to be and so forth. You'll see it here as we read it. So starting at verse 1 of chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some other um, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And uh, such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament or the New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, he's talking here about the law of Moses, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, now here's where I want you to start noticing this whole thing of glory and, and how he shows what we have today compared to what was the law. So, if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stone, was glorious. So he's saying the law was glorious. It really was. It had to be for God to give it to Moses. And when God did give it to Moses, Moses' face shone. It was glorious. It really was. But look at what he says here. If that was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses... For the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doeth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. There's that word righteousness again we talked about yesterday. So in other words... What was glorious in the Old Testament to a point that Moses had to veil his face, we have the New Covenant, the New Testament, which is much more glorious. It's a beautiful thing. Now he said, verse 10, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. He's saying here, yes, there was glory in the law. There was glory in that. But it's, it's like there was none compared to what we have now. Look what, what, look what excels that. Look what remains. Seeing that we have such hope, we use great plainness or boldness, is what that word can say, boldness of speech. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end, that which was, is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day, and now notice what he's saying here about the Jewish people that couldn't understand the, the, the New Testament. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. The veil of the temple was done away with too. But even unto this day, when Moses read, the veil is upon their heart. And that word veil there, is, interestingly enough, is, is very similar to the word that's used uh, for veil in 1 Corinthians 11, with the exception of one verse there. Uh, there's catacalupto or uh, uh, catalupto or kaluma is in this verse here. That same kind of veil. Um, now, verse 17 and 18. I want us to really think about this. Now the Spirit of the Lord, now the, now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or freedom from the law of Moses. But we all with open face, and that word open there is anakalupto, which means not veiled. He uses the same word in the Greek as what he would be saying for veil, only it's not veiled. And some of your translations, I think actually uh, the ESV may say unveiled instead of open. Uh, he says there that with unveiled face, beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord. So it's as though we look into a mirror, and in that mirror we can see the glory of the Lord, that, that we can see it. 
and, and he mentions it here. We'll get to it in chapter 4, but I'll mention it now. Remember that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you want to see God, who is a spirit, look at Jesus Christ, his son. And he's saying here, now in the Old Testament, you know, Moses even had to veil his face because the glory shone. And uh, after he spent time with the glory of the Lord, it was, it was, he couldn't even look on him. It shone. And now he says that we have the opportunity to look as it is in a mirror and behold the glory of the Lord. Now, it, it gets, in my mind, it gets even better here. It says, we behold, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, and are changed. Or that word change is that metamorphous word, that, uh, like, a, like an old uh, caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Uh, it says, we are uh, metamorphosed, if you will, into the same image of that one we're looking into in the mirror. Now, he doesn't share his glory with anyone. But look what it says. Into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. When we behold the glory of God, and we look into that mirror, and James talks about, if you look into the mirror of the Word, basically, and you don't do anything, it doesn't do you any good. Think about it this way. When we look into the, the mirror that, that holds the glory of God, and we see that in the Word of God, and it says by His Spirit, we look into that, and we see the glory. What does it do to us? Does it change us? Now, I don't know about you. I'm At my age, you know, I look in a mirror, and... I, no, at my age, there's not much you can do. It's just kind of, oh, you can move a little bit of hair here or there and, you know, just make sure there's nothing just stuck on your face there or something. But you can't do a whole lot anymore. Um, some people try to, you know, they do the whole makeover thing and it makes them look worse than when they started, that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, we, we use a mirror to look into and see things. And generally, if there's something there we don't like, we change it as much as humanly possible anymore. What do you do when you look into the Word of God or when you look and you behold the glory of the Lord and you see yourself? Does it change you? It says here, it, it, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory. And someone said that that changing from glory to glory is kind of like this when you see something and God shows you something by his spirit that when you bring that up to you, you get that in order then he shows you something else and you have more knowledge and until you're ready to bring it up and get it like it is in the mirror you kind of stuck it but from glory to glory we are changed by the spirit I don't know I find that exciting that God's glory is there and, and we can see it and then Let's go on into chapter 4 and see what we're to do with that. Therefore, because of that, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things. In other words, we look into that mirror, we see the glory of God, we want to get rid of these kind of things. Dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth or revealing the truth and demonstrating it, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be, and in the King James it says hid, again that word is calupto, if our God, and notice how he uses these words kind of back and forth here so we can understand it. But if our gospel be veiled, it is veiled to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which are uh, believe not, that the light of the glorious, now see that, the glorious gospel, the glorious good news of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So, what is that, how does that work for us? Now I realize it still comes down to the heart of people being willing and, and open to receiving 
But do our lives so reflect the glory of Christ that it's unveiled to people who look upon us? Or are we like Moses, in a sense, who we veil and then they can't see us? I think if we are having the glory of the Lord shining for, if we have, if we're over here in verse um, 18 of chapter 3, where it says that the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. If that's going on and that has happened, we won't be veiling the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. It will be obvious to people. People will be wondering what is different about them. Why did they make that decision? Why did they choose to do that? Why did he say that? Or why did she say that? Or why did she respond that way? Carl shared a story there, that uh, lady that texted him about the beehives, you know, and his response. And, well, she's over there because... That's how we are to live our lives. So that when people see things in our lives, that it reflects the very glory of God. And that that's quite a responsibility, isn't it? Because people will see either the reflection and the glory of Christ shining out of us, or it will be hid to them that are lost. Hid to them. Let's read on down through here. It says then, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves servants for your sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The face of Jesus Christ goes back to verse 18 there, with open face. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Yeah, it's in our earthen vessels. We're still in these bodies. We still live in these bodies. And we're still going about day by day. And we're still, and and he'll show some things here. And why does he mention the fact that we have this treasure of God's glory in earthen vessels? Because it says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It is God's glory. It is God's power. But we need to reflect that to others. And then he says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, or obvious. Is the life of the Lord Jesus obvious in my body? In my, as I go about, Is it obvious to people? Is it made manifest? For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore we speak. Maybe that's one reason why we don't speak up enough sometimes. Maybe we don't believe enough. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Now I want to think about this verse here a little bit. That word redound means to contribute. Now, I said we cannot add to the glory of God. It is what it is. But it's interesting in this verse it says that through the thanksgiving of many, that that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many contribute to the glory of God. That comes back to the whole thing of praise and worship and God's grace being known and His glory being known and abounding to others. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Now, here's the verse that I want you to notice, how Paul, through the inspiration of the Spirit, uses this idea of 
the word glory and its, its base word there meaning weight or heavy, how he uses that in this verse. For our light affliction. And sometimes our afflictions don't feel very light. But our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He uses that weight of glory, that heaviness of glory, compared to the light afflictions that we deal with now. Our afflictions sometimes seem pretty heavy, and sometimes they are for us. They feel pretty heavy. They don't feel light. And you might say, well, maybe the Apostle Paul just didn't know. He just didn't understand. He just didn't have any afflictions. <laughs> read, his, read his whole pedigree when he talks about how many times he was beaten and how many times he was in prison, and he was this and he was that. He was shipwrecked um, at least four times. Some of you are going to say, wait, wait, wait. No, talk to me about that later. Shipwrecked probably four times in his life. Uh, bad things in prison. And just all these horrible things that happened to him. And besides that, he had in his memory the, the memories of when he was, before he was saved, of hauling off men and women to prison and imprisoning them. And he probably carried with him the scars of hearing their children crying and screaming as he hauled them off to prison and all this stuff. And he carried all that with him. And yet he says, compared to this eternal weight of glory, he said, it's a light affliction. Why? It's but for a moment. In the span of eternity, these things that seem so heavy now and are heavy are light as we compare it to the glory that we shall be, uh, shall be revealed in heaven. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, the things which are not seen are eternal. And then you go over into the next chapter, and you can see there where he says, um, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. But he says he'd like to be rather absent from the body and present with the Lord. If you think about that verse in its context here of this glory and revealing it to others. So my question this morning is for, for me and for each of us. Are you looking in to that mirror of the glory of Christ? And is it changing you? Image to image. Are you becoming more like what you see in the mirror? And you say, well, I'll never get that, that like that. I'll never be. Are you changing, though? Are you growing? Are you becoming more and more like that? Are the things that don't look like what you see in the mirror being changed and taken away and worked on? And it says it's by the Spirit of the Lord. You can't do all that on your own. Allow the Holy Spirit to convict and work and then make the changes we need to make. Well, there's some exciting things coming, too, about the glory of the Lord and about seeing Jesus for who He is and so forth and really seeing Him face to face. Turn with me to 1 John. First John chapter 3. And we'll read the first three verses here. 1 John chapter 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Behold, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall see him even more clearly than we can possibly see him now. We shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. That's that changing from glory to glory, that changing, that working. We have that hope. Now I'd like for you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. And again, again, it may depend on your view of eschatology, or it probably does, when exactly this is and how it is. But I think it's beautiful. Chapter 21 of Revelation, verses 22 and 23. 
He says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of the Lord did lighten it or illuminate it. You see that? The glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord did illuminate the city and lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Which means if the glory lighten it and the Lamb is the light of it, the Lamb is the glory of God. And that's what we have to look forward to, even even beyond the glory we see here. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Am I reflecting that light today? Let's pray.